Dr. Cedric Wood with the four quadrants of uh, core parenting, and we're looking forward to that presentation. Dr. Jazzy, would you tell us a little bit about DQ Counseling? Sure. Um, but first of all, for those of you online, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 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 nine. we have like 10 people here. So we're really excited. This is the first time in two years that we've had human beings in front of us while we're doing it. So I'm grateful you all made it and thank you for coming out. And excited. And very excited. <laughs> um, D2 Counseling is a group of therapists that are um, seasoned therapists that work in a variety of modes of therapy and with the, uh, we see um, clients from age three to 93 and we offer groups and intensives and lots of couples work, couples intensives, um, family of origin intensives, um, parent child intensives, and uh, we'd love you to visit our website, dqcounseling.com, for um, more details on all of that. For tonight's presentation, we do offer CEUs for those in attendance, both in person and at home. And we will put in the chat the process by which you can get CEUs. For folks here, we do have CEUs available at the table uh, with the presentation tonight. So with that, we will allow Dr. Wood to um, introduce himself, and we look forward to his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dina and Daniel. Very good. I'm so happy to be here. Y'all don't know this until I tell you, but I've been dreaming of being the Tuesday night speaker for about, I'm sorry, thank you, Margaret. My dear friend, Margaret, I completely forgot. She's got my back. Uh, been dreaming of it for so long because they've been having it here for years and years and years. I kept saying, I want to talk, let me talk. So here I am. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. Uh, before uh, the actual program begins, I have to do a little couple of commercials. Um, at any other time that you guys might want to have me talk, I might go over my nine ego states of transactional analysis. If parents knew this, they'd be much better parents. This is a way of understanding healthy communication based on Eric Burns transactional analysis, the three ego states of parent, adult, child. I've turned it into nine, so it's much more, has much more specificity. My other one, this is my 2020 creation. I can go, I can do an hour and a half on this one. This is my rotary engine of life based on Abraham Maslow's basic human needs. I made it much more complex and therefore I hopefully more useful and helpful. So I'm so proud of, I share that with many of my clients, this one with many, even more of my clients. But today I'm going to be going over what I created uh, a number of years ago, and, uh, and, um, and I'm so happy to bring this to you. So it's called the Four Quadrants of Four Parenting. So you're going to find out why I call, that, call it that in a minute. So healthy parenting education is so necessary. I can't emphasize that enough. I wish there were a hundred speakers across Texas this week or this month doing exactly what I'm doing tonight. I want to multiply myself by, by a hundred. That's how important it is. And I hope by the end of the hour, you're going you're to have a better sense of that. Um, so where do I get my passion? For doing this, I've been leading psych groups in psychiatric hospital for 30 years. So yes, of course, we give them medication they need. Yes, of course, um, uh, the social workers work with them. But we also have groups, and that's my job. I lead the groups. And I hear all the stories, because I'm more interested, I think, than most of the others. What happened when you were a child? And almost no one says, nothing. I had a great childhood. My mom and dad were together. They loved each other. We were happy. The ones that do say that, almost everyone has suffered a head injury at the age of 20 or 30. That can create depression. But except for those, everybody else has their story of what happened to them. Um, 
I've, I've switched that one. Um, so um, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to say there's five levels of, of parents. And I do this partly because I want the great parents in the room and, and on Zoom to realize I'm not really talking to you. I'm preaching to the choir for you guys. Even for level four, you're good parents. You make a mistake here or there, but who doesn't? The kids will be fine. Kids are resilient. They'll bounce back, you know, for what, you know, this event or that event. My concern is more for level three, four, uh, th three two, and one level. Even level three uh, parents do a good job. They love their kids. They have a good, stable home life. But they make mistakes on a regular basis. And it'd be so great if they would boost their parenting skills a little bit. But the ones I'm really concerned about are, are level two and level one parents. Level two parents are not good parents. They make mistakes all the time. And they show no concern about learning healthy parenting. I just do it the way I do it. I wrote a parenting calendar, if I can sneak back here and get it, many, many years ago. And I went to the talk show host in San Antonio. And I said, I'd like to be interviewed so people can see my parenting calendar. And she said, Cedric, we all know parenting. You just fly by the seat of your pants. You just kind of learn as you go along. Really? OK. She didn't have me as a guest. So uh, level one parents, we see them in the news on a regular basis. So uh, not only does my heart go out to the children that I'm trying to keep from bad parenting, but I'm also here for the parents. Because more and more, we're seeing parents that are suffering because of what their child did. So I'm here for the parents to keep you guys safe as much as I'm here to keep the children safe, right? Um, so this is kind of a, you can see I'm not an artist, but this just really hit me one day, is that life should be full of moments of joy, moments of peace. I have felt deep and profound peace sitting in the sanctuary down the hallway. They've got the music going, and, and it'll just make you feel so nice and relaxed. And that's what we all, you know, down below the line is regular life. We're going along. And we might even be sad some days. But thank goodness, things resolve themselves. And we rise above that line oh, into a moment of peace and joy. How can I help more, as many people as possible, have moments of peace and joy? By helping these kids have parents that interact with them, that not only create moments of joy for them as children, but for the rest of their lives. Because their ability to feel joy so much depends on what happened to them as children. Um, for instance, there's so much drug use, alcoholism, and they come into the hospital. I talk to them on a regular basis in my groups, Unit 3 at the hospital right up the road here. And um, why have they been drinking for years and years? Why do they keep going back to that heroin, like the young lady said two days ago on Sunday? She just, things go well, things go good, so I feel good, so I want to celebrate. And I go use heroin. Heroin, OK. So why does she do that? I started going over the eight things we need to protect children from. The first one was trauma. And her face turns, you know that face, that look right before you start crying? She knew. She knew what I was talking about. And so if we can give them as much joy as possible, they won't be tempted. If they have a good day, a good week, they'll go out and they'll sit, stand, sit by the lake and enjoy the beautiful sunshine. They won't go get high. Okay, if we do that good, there's my eight things. I call it trouncel. I hope someday that everybody will know what that means. It's an acronym, of course. You can see what those words. I have gone over this list as my entire group at the hospital hundreds of times. 
I never get tired of going over it. I turn it into a guessing game. What does the T stand for? And they try to guess, and I go down the whole thing. So we're going to be talking more about this list as we go through. I can't help but mention the dark triad. Um, this, is, this is profound. Um, you know, dictators and other people have traits of narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. And then there's the associated traits. I just found this on my phone the other day. It's like, okay, good. You can see those traits of somebody that uh, has a mindset of not being real healthy at all. Um, so let's look at some examples of criminality that, on, that very often at least have the traits of the dark triad, if not actually doing the traits, the three traits. Um, and so I just had this in here. I, ha I happen to notice, and I'm going to be covering the two Ethans in a minute. So I'm just going to uh, go on by here. Uh, let's start talking about some people that were not experiencing joy. In fact, they were experiencing deep pain and sorrow. And then out of that comes suicidal ideation. Out of that comes... Uh, homicidal drives. He drove 10 hours to El Paso so he could do what? Kill 22 people and wound a whole bunch of others at Walmart. You remember that just a few years ago. I hate to put this up here, but that's his dad. He's an LPC counselor in the area. Sorry, Brian, but you did not do a good job during the first 22 years of your son's life. So I hurt for you, but my message to you is the same to all parents, step up. There was one story that it was Christmas Eve and the kids went to bed excited about Christmas the next day. They got up the next day, dad was gone. Mom had jumped in her car and drove to Oklahoma to be with her family. There were the kids. Where's mom? Where's dad? That had to have been very, very hurtful. And that's the kind of stuff that happens. A fight and then gunfire. National news. Right up here in Arlington. What happened? A young man took a gun. He was angry. There was a fight. I still don't know exactly the details about it. Here's his family. They're on TV. They stepped up and said, we are his parents. How many parents have stepped up, parents of school shooters and others, and said, where are the parents? One in 500? Maybe one in 300? I mean, just virtually never. Where are the parents? They're nowhere to be found. But these people were willing to step up and said, we're here and we're supporting our son for the best possible outcome. And so good for them. Where were the parents of the guy who took the hostage of the rabbi right up the road here? What city was it in? Colleyville. Where's his parents? Did they do a good job? Terrorists going to another country, gets a gun, takes people hostage. I'm going to I'm going to leave in a body bag. He knew what was going to happen. It's so tragic. And each and every one of these shooters, once upon a time, were innocent little children. They weren't psychopaths. They weren't narcissists. They were innocent children. Who was taking care of them? so that they could grow up happy, strong, and healthy, and ready to live life to the fullest. It's pretty easy to guess that didn't happen for that man. Um, another example of shooting the gun over in Houston. Oh, it just, just starts right up. Okay. Or attempted capital murder. He 
He's now charged with being a felon in possession of a gun and illegally modifying a weapon to operate as a machine gun. Two of the three officers injured in the shooting are out of the hospital and the third officer is recovering. He's a monstrous looking guy there, but I can guarantee, I don't even know him, but I can guarantee something about him. He was an innocent little boy when he was two and three and four years old. What happened to him? Do we care? You're not going to see the end of the news program which says that now we've looked into his uh, parents' uh, life and his childhood and we've discovered that he experienced this, this, and this. They never explain what went wrong. So that's what I'm going to do here tonight. Well, that was that was uh, the shooting uh, four years ago in, well, there you go, Santa Fe High School. There's my Avalon right there. Sad scene, terrible scene with all kinds of posters. And, uh, and I just read today that the young man is not going to stand trial because he's not competent to stand trial. What happened to him? If your last name starts with a C, don't name your son Ethan, because we have two Ethan C's. Let me see if I can, this one didn't start automatically. 15 years old in Michigan, goes in and shoots about 11 kids, mom and dad. Did they think that was gonna happen that day? No way. Were they horrified? Absolutely. Did they step up and say, you know, where are the parents? No, they jumped in the car and they went off in some building up, up uh, you know, outside the town to, to hide. Okay, well, they were found, handcuffed. So I'm not just here advocating for the children. I'm here advocating for the parents. Do you want this to happen to you? No. Well, then step up and learn healthy parenting skills. What happened to young Ethan Crumley? Well, his parents must not have been get, getting very long. There was a news that said she was having an affair. Okay, and so they had horses, I guess. They were selling their horses. If he loved horses, that would have been a big loss. His dog, his family dog had just died. It keeps going. His best friend just moved away. This young guy was in a heap of hurt. And I guess his parents didn't realize it. And we're going to find out they're failing in a minute. So the school people did the right thing. They called, Mom, Dad, something's showing up here. You need to come. You need to come uh, up to the school. Oh, just leaving. We've got to go back to work. It's no big deal. We, we, we're busy, we gotta go. They wouldn't take him out of school. Four beautiful young people dead because of their decision. This is what they had on his test. A gun to draw on there. Somebody else shot. Blood everywhere, he writes on the test. The thoughts won't stop. This young man was hurting and struggling. Where was mom and dad to get him into a therapist's office? February 4th. I mean, it just doesn't stop. 41-year-old killed his dad, killed his mom, killed his stepdad, killed his child. What happened to him? We never explore that on TV, except one show on TV was I'm incredible. You've got to go to YouTube and watch The Killer at Thurston High, a frontline special. Uh, excellent. I hope it won a lot of awards because it clearly showed what that young man experienced up in Washington. He <sighs> killed his parents, went to school, killed a kid there, shot at a teacher. I don't know. He's in jail for the rest of his life. It's tragic. Just watch that on YouTube. Killer at Thurston High. Uh, and we all remember Sandy Hook. What happened there? Killed those kids. News report said, renewed nation's gun safety debate. 
Okay, well, that's part of what's going on. Why didn't it renew the nation's healthy parenting, healthy childhood debate? Oh, we don't really care about that. We just care about controlling the guns. Because, come on, he was suffering. Nobody does that that's not suffering and in a whole lot of inner pain. What did his mom and dad divorced? Dad took off with the brother he probably looked up to and loved, took off and moved to, I don't know, Boston, I think. So he suffered. He was suffering loss. And then we have Parkland, Florida, 2018. Nicholas Cruz shot 34, killing 17 kids. He lost his father when he was 10 years old. His friend said he really, his personality changed. Loss is a terrible thing. His mother was interviewed before the uh, shooting. It had to be because, because she passed away before the shooting. So he lost his mother to pneumonia, moved in with a friend. He was the nicest young man, those parents said, the people he moved into. But he went and got their gun, went to school, and killed all those people. She, I wish she had called the family therapist 39 times. What about that? Why not call the professional that's trained and educated to really help instead of just calling the police? We're here. The therapist in the room, the therapist, we're here for you. Well, I dedicate this program to John Bradshaw. He's just incredible. Some of you are old enough to remember his PBS shows back in, well, 82 and 90 and around in there, right, right? Wonderful. I thought, man, this is the new way of doing therapy and thinking it's going to spread and all the professors are going to be talking about this. Dina says, no, it never went anywhere. But, but kudos to SMU. They had John Bradshaw come up and teach a whole class in the counseling department out at SMU. I signed up, I paid that tuition, and I attended. And as always, he was great. He, he did his first presentation on PBS about eight stages of man. Um, and as he's talking, and I hope it's going to work, um, I just want you to key in on these words. Eric Erickson wrote the book, and Eight Stages of Man, and of course all psychology students know about Eric Erickson. He talks about bonding with your parent. It creates a healthy personality. It gives you ego strength. That's a good thing. Um, having the presence of a loving, mothering mother or mothering person. Here's the book, Identity in the Life Cycle. And John Bradshaw is presenting on PBS. <clears throat> I wish I meant to have a microphone and a speaker, I guess. The bonding that takes place with the mother. Because the mothers leave their children, put them in other homes. But this study was one of the most phenomenal ones teaching us something about the nature of bonding for a healthy personality. Healthy personality. You've got to have trust. And not mistrust. Eric Erickson, who I'm using as my resource person in this series, says that in the first 15 months of life, this ego strength is developed. The speaker ego? E uh, what, what's that? There's a speakerphone on the bottom right. If you could tell, I would have a speaker. Like loud, maybe. Well, it's coming from here. I wish I could just put this. We really don't have a, a speaker here to, like, I should have had it mic'd. But he talks about how when, if you can work through these uh, stages, but more, more importantly as a child, you learn to trust, et cetera, then you will develop the ego strength and you will never get a gun to go into a store like over there on Walnut Street and shoot and kill four people in the 7-Eleven. I guess that kid's still on the run. I don't know. You all saw that, right? In the news. Now, I just threw that in there. That's the rotary engine of life right there. 
He's talking about the child getting his needs met. If a child goes through this process and gets his or her needs met, they will grow up happy and healthy. But if they don't, well, it's still as adult, we can make adult choices to do the right thing and try to get our needs met as an adult. That will help us be happy and strong. That happened today. I didn't, couldn't transfer the video, but y'all saw that on the news this morning about a man uh, stalked a young lady, went into her apartment and stabbed her to death, death on Sunday. Good, great. Do you think he was raised in a happy mom and dad situation, developing trust and self-confidence? No way, didn't happen. So is that my feedback? Okay, brain structure and brain chemistry is shaped as a child growing up. We are our brains. If our brains shut down, we fall on the floor, we can't think, we can't move, we can't feel. Only reason I can raise my arm like this, the only reason, is because brain neurons are firing in my brain. Everything that you do think, feel, is your brain. Um, I hope that you'll read Alice Miller, whether you're a, a therapist or not. There should not be a therapist in Texas that has not read Alice Miller. John Bradshaw read her. Here's her book, Drama of the Gifted Child. She lays it out beautifully. You can learn why Hitler became Hitler by reading the chapter on him. You'll, you'll learn what, how and why that happened. So many good books. The Boy Crisis, published right up here on a uh, publisher on, on, Central, on Central High. Narcissism and Machiavelli in Youth explains the traits and where they come from. What are ACEs? I'd never heard that till a couple years ago. Adverse Childhood Experiences. Thank you, Prevent Child Abuse America, for, for getting that word out. Uh, I wish every parent would, would know to, and, and protect their child from ACEs. Traumatic events, violence, abuse, neglect. We carry that in the neurons of our brain. Terrible. There are people that are trying to help parents. And one that I found at APA was 123 Magic. So he's got his website up there. I introduced, I don't know if Juan might remember that, we had Dr. Colin Ross speak one day. And I said, uh, so glad to have this speaker. Uh, I don't think we're getting the word out about good parenting. I think the job we're doing, if we gave it a grade, is about a D plus. And he said, no, it's a D minus. I said, okay, I'll go along. You're, you're the expert, you're the psychiatrist who's written so many books, spoken so many times on trauma in childhood, and then how do you do the therapy around that trauma? Where does dissociative identity disorder come from? It's from trauma in childhood. <clears throat> this is the basic book, one of them that John Bradshaw read and was inspired. He was always talking about the wounded inner child I have the wounded inner child here on my nine. Uh, that's not really a part of TA, but I think it's very useful. And this book, Your Inner Child of the Past, Hugh Misseldine. Brilliant psychiatrist, brilliant book. How many people have read this or know what he said who are parents? One in a hundred thousand. We're not getting the word out there to the people who need to know about this. Read any of these books. Oh my gosh, these books are all excellent. John Bradshaw, Healing the Shame That Binds You, On the Family, or Homecoming. I just picked this one up the other day at the very bottom there. I bought it years ago, never read it, picked it up. What does this book say? A page or two, brilliant. All About Sexual Abuse, Double Bind by Carly Trotter, brilliant. If you are a therapist and you wanna know where can I go to learn more about this kind of stuff, well, there's an organization in Canada, the Institute for Child Psychology. They're coming up with great CEUs for us to go to. Really good. There's two that are coming up. April 22nd, this one's Understanding Deeply Feeling Kids. How many parents in Dallas and Texas that have deeply feeling kids and don't understand what's going on or how to deal with it? 95, 99% of them, they should tune in. They should find out how to deal with that. Two CEUs I saw this past year, brilliant. 
Dr. Angelo Pizzotti, Ad Adverse Childhood Experiences, Lifelong Consequences, and How to Overcome Them. It was like about a six-hour CEU. Loved it. And our own Houston native, Bruce Perry, he, his was the impact of trauma and neglect on the developing child. Well, every child is developing, but the impact of trauma and neglect and my other things on my eight things and trouncel, we can just use that as a catch-all phrase, trouncel, impacts their development and not in a good way. Two books named Why Good People Do Bad Things. <clears throat> uh, very good books. Understanding our darker selves. Understanding our dark side. Where does our dark side get developed? In childhood. Here it is. This is what you came for. The four quadrants of poor parenting. Mom, dad, don't do these things, please. Okay? It occurred to me one day that all the bad parenting that I'd read about for years and years, I was helping to raise a couple of boys way back when, and uh, the mother of the boy said, Read this book, Your Child's Self-Esteem by Dorothy Corkill Briggs. Blew my mind. This is brilliant, and I've never stopped loving the concept of healthy parenting, healthy communication. Never stopped since, what was that, 1984 or something. Um, and so it all came together one day. I was just getting ready to go out on a jog, and I'm like, wait a minute. Kids need two things, love and structure. The mistakes parent makes are too much structure, too little structure. Too much love, too little love. There's a, there's a quadrupolar thing there. This really organizes all bad parenting. I'm sure there's one or two things you can help me out and suggest, tell me what I left out. I welcome your input. But if parents could, could, could study this, Wow, they would have a better idea in their minds of what not to do. Let's begin. A1, a communication style that's aggressive, angry, maybe rigid, critical, critical controlling, and, and demanding. That's the critical parent voice in transactional analysis. So I teach all my parents, my couples, don't go into the critical parent voice or ego state because you're going to say things <clears throat> that are hurtful. I had one young man tell me that my father would sit me down and have a talk with me about my bad behavior. Well, good for him. That's what parents should do. Need to talk to you, son. Let's, let's go into your bedroom and have a chat. But then he said he would talk down to me, critical parent, shaming parent, John Bradshaw's shame-based communication, and I felt like a little worm or a little bug, and that's gone on for years. If I could tell you his story, you'd go, well, that wasn't a very good outcome, was it, Dad? Because he used the parent voice, <clears throat> and that didn't hit this young boy's heart in a very good way. And of course, A2, everybody knows about physical abuse. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't slap kids around and, and beat on them and, and uh, take sticks to them and things like that, okay, to get them to coerce them into obedience. But parents are doing it all across Dallas, Texas today. They'll do it again tomorrow. They might even be going on right now if we could hear it. Can you hear it? Just kind of listen in a little bit. Right down the road, there's a house right up the road here where a kid's being slapped around and beaten. It goes on all the time. Okay, so we have all these people we've talked about that have grown up to be bad. Well, let's, let's let Dr. Phil help us out here about a kid who hasn't grown up, but he's behaving badly right now. Well... We need to help straighten him out so that he doesn't behave badly. I don't have sound on it, but she's saying he hits me in the face and he pushes me up against this table. If he doesn't behave and there's more incidents, he could be going to juvie when he turns 18. He deserves it, right? 
Well, her name is Summer, and so Summer's mother is on the show. And Summer's mother reports that the mom is provoking this behavior, destroying her grandson, regularly telling him she doesn't want him anymore. <clears throat> My grandson, Ash, goes into violent, volatile behavior. You're grounded. Stop videoing me. She's very antagonistic, hateful, and angry towards him. She's saying to her daughter, why are you treating my grandson like this? Calls him every name in the books. Her boyfriend tries to parent him. When he's over at his grandmother's house, he behaves perfectly well. He's a nice young man. The grandmother's not provoking this behavior. Anytime, so whether you're in your relationship or you have a child or even your parent, if they're behaving badly, you should always ask yourself, how am I adding in, how am I feeding into that in some way? There's the mom's boyfriend trying to talk to him. I, I'm, I'm sure he does some good, but, um, but so he's that criminal we're going to be hearing about in 10 or 20 years. Maybe not. Hopefully not. Hopefully the family will now go to get some family therapy and work on their parenting and he'll grow up and be just fine. Talk about not hitting. Uh, a lot of people who give talks like this will cite this research and that research and this author and I should do the same thing. But I, I'm just not into presenting in that way. So I'll do one. Here's one uh, article that said that childhood spanking is linked to physical, psychological, and behavioral outcomes in adolescence. There are tens of thousands of articles like that. You know, it's, you know I was at APA one year, and I can't remember who it is. I, I, know, I know him, but he said, we're doing all this great research and he said to the audience, I think he was in Toronto, but we're not getting the information to the people who needs this information. We are studying it as psychologists and then we teach it to our psychology students and then they help the clients to come in to see them, but we're not broadcasting it, this information we have in all these journals that uh, is good information, but we're not getting the word out to the people who need it. Gosh, maybe we should license parents. Maybe we should force them to go. You can't be a parent until you get your license. Sorry. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But this man wrote so eloquently that some publisher published his book. I haven't gotten a book published like that. Must be something. I read the first chapter. Brilliant. Couldn't have laid it out better. Okay, we've done A1, A2, now A3. Now A3 and A4 are the ones that don't fit into the heading of too much structure uh, like all the other 16 sub areas do. So forgive me, I'd have to put it in there somewhere. So I'm putting it into the A quadrant. Uh, I wanna ask, oh, I'm gonna run out of juice, I hope not. Um, I'm gonna ask if any of y'all have heard of R.D. Lang. No? Please go read this chapter. It is sine qua non. You cannot be a therapist and not have read this chapter because when parents do what he calls mystification long enough, over the years, the child becomes schizophrenic. That's what he says. Now, he didn't have way back in the 50s and 60s depressed with psychotic features, schizoaffective disorder, psychosis NOS, Bipolar with psychotic features. They didn't have all those finer tuned, uh, so he just used the word schizophrenic. Well, um, it can lead to psychosis because the parent doubts or change or tries to alter my personal experience. I'll give you an example from John Bradshaw. He was a kid, he was at home, he comes downstairs, summer, friends are gone. Mom, <sighs> I'm bored and I'm lonely. I don't have a thing to do. 
She said, you're not bored, you're not alone, you've got plenty of toys upstairs, now go upstairs and play. He walks upstairs. Gee whiz, I could have sworn I felt bored and lonely a while ago. I guess I don't even know my own mind. That's a dangerous place to go with a child. You don't know your own thoughts. You don't know what you feel. I had a lovely young lady in the psychiatric unit, Presbyterian, Jackson 5, anybody worked or been in? Don't, don't answer that. Um, uh, she said her father was getting his PhD in, clin in counseling psychology. She said, the other day my father told me, you're only 19, you don't know what you feel. She shared that as a, you know, with pain in her heart. I said, I can't believe that. That's mystification. It's not far from the idea of gaslighting. We hear that a lot these days. I have a lot of my clients say gaslighting. It's, it's doubting what you're saying or trying to make you think something that you don't really think. So to continue A3 with poor communication, shame-based, John Bradshaw put that out there very, very well, is, is doing a lot of the shaming of what someone dreams of, what a kid wants, what a kid thinks, what a kid feels. I don't feel like going over to grandparents' house. Uh, what do you mean you don't feel like going? Of course you feel like it. You always have a good time. There, I helped him get a better attitude. No, you just shamed him for feeling what he feels. That's bad, dangerous. Okay, now we get to A4. Again, this is not really uh, structure but I have to put it in there somewhere. A parent could be a perfect parent and yet still create an environment of what? Chaos. What is chaos? Well, it's a lot of turmoil going on over here, a lot of conflict going on in the back bedroom, uh, too many changes like moving too often. I was leading the, uh, a group in the outpatient uh, over at, uh, at, at Green Oaks and I'm going over this. And a lady raised up and says, well, what, what's wrong with that? I move every year. I pick, pack up my kids, I move every year. I didn't have to say a thing. The whole crowd of people in the group went, really? That's bad, that's hard on kids. Kids are resilient, they can handle a move or two, maybe three, but you start moving because you have a job or you're in the Air Force or you're on the run, five, six, seven, eight, and every time I go, somebody says, My, I moved 13 times when I was growing up. Okay, well, that's part of the reason you're here in the psychiatric hospital right now. That's too much chaos. Let's let Dr. Phil help us out again. And there's a lot to do here because this is chaotic. There's no behavioral pattern here. There's no consistency, and there are no contingencies. What jumps out to you the most? And it got so bad, they ended up on a nationally televised TV show to find out what was going on. Dr. Phil figured it out. Too much chaos. Get those rules, get those expectations going, get those limits, get those boundaries going, get those consequences for bad behavior. Structure. Patterns, they thrive. Abraham Maslow mentioned that. Pattern and consistency. Okay, now we're gonna go over to the B quadrant. Too much love. I know you're, think, you're thinking there's no way we can have too much love, but let me just explain what I mean by that. I had a, a, a family come, mother and a son come in. She had divorced the husband. What happened? Well, my husband kept getting so angry at him forcing him to study math way beyond his years. Keep studying, keep trying. And my son would start crying and, and get mad. And she said, finally, I just divorced him. And uh, being a family therapist, I said, let's get this guy in here. Let's find out what's going on. So he came in, he was nice enough to come in, and he wanted his son to be a good student. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, hammering and hounding a child to learn math way beyond your years not good. Finally, I felt like the time was right. I said, what was your end goal for doing that? Was it to maybe get him to be so good at this so he could get a scholarship? He says, yeah. That's why I did it. He wanted him to get a scholarship to college. 
It's a good goal. How he went about it, not good. <clears throat> this is kind of B2 is parents that uh, make all the decisions for the child and they protect the child from all harm. There's this hidden agenda of, I want to keep you close and I want to keep you safe. And what's going on? The parent is not, does not have ego strength. The parent is trying to take care of her or his needs. Stay close. No, you can't go across the street to play. No, it's dangerous over there. You, you need to stay home. And the child never learns until they figure it out at the age of 29, you know, that, oh, my mother was needy. She wasn't just trying to keep me safe. She was taking care of her own egocentric needs. B3 now. Um, it's kind of very similar, but it's, it's overly involved, overly doing for the child instead of letting them do their own chores and take care of their own mess. B4, sexual abuse. Um, there's that book again, The Double Bind. It's something we need to talk about. We see story after story after story after story, and we don't ever have news person say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, C-SPAN. C-SPAN 1, government stuff. C-SPAN 2, government stuff. C-SPAN 3, what is that? Does anybody ever watch C-SPAN 3? The History Channel. Love it. I love history. One of the talks was... Abraham Lincoln and his sense of humor. Okay, where is C-SPAN 4? How to live a happy and productive life and be smart in psychology. Here we're going to have this professor. We're going to have this motivational speaker. Where's C-SPAN 4? Well, we're not really interested in healthy minds. Okay, I'm being sarcastic. It, uh, I hope someday they're going to they're get that on there. Uh, and then they'll have shows about don't sexually abuse kids. Gloria Stefan came out finally after I, I was abused at the age of nine. And I hate to say it, but I only have the best intentions at heart. The CEU presenter said it, so I'm just repeating what she said. It happens more in Hispanic community than the others. That's what she said. And I, and I don't doubt it based on my client that came in me and told me what happened to her as a little girl south of Mexico. What happened to her as an adult in North Texas by a guy from her, her home country. Horrifying. And, but I put the weight on my shoulders. It's partly my fault because I have not presented this 500 times. I could have presented it in 1990, 91, 92, 93. I got my master's in 91. I could have presented 2000, 2005, 2000. I didn't. I'm to blame for these things happening because I haven't been out there on TV, on the website, saying, don't do this. Don't do this. But I'm saying it now. She goes on to say, it is so important to try to prevent. So I honor her for, step, for speaking out. Quadrant C. So we've gone A and B. We've done A. We've done B. Now C. Right here. Number one, lack of structure. No rules. Uh, no routine. No expectations for good behavior. C2, not holding the child accountable once they do misbehave. This is called structure. This is too, this is too little structure. And parents don't do it for various reasons. Um, oh. Y'all know him, don't you? One or two of you, remember? Ethan? Okay. Yeah. yeah. What did D Magazine say about his parents? <laughs> Is that what they expecting to do when they were raising him? No. I guess they thought they were being good parents. They were horrible parents, allowing him to drink. They had two houses. They were so rich. He lived at one house all by himself to drink as much and have parties as much as he wanted. So he got drunk one night, got in his truck, had friends in the back, slam into four people on the side of the road, killed them all. Unbelievable. Well, I'm running out of time, but. So I would like to be able, if you would allow me to be. Y'all know Sinead O'Connor. 
She's going to make a list of all the artists that died before their time because of drugs and alcohol use. Brad Dell, Ben Wellnick, Ronnie Montrose, Bob Welsh, Keith Emerson, Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, Kurt Cobain, obviously. So a whole movie on her alcoholism. She knew Connor was shamelessly abused as a child by her mother. Uh oh, there I go. Well, it'll be fun finishing without a notice. ACEs. Adult ad, uh, childhood experiences, adverse community environments. Notice it says substance abuse, abuse there. All those things children need to be protected from. I'll skip over that. D, one, and two, and three, and four. So here we are. We're at the last quadrant over here, down here. What is that? Too little love. And number one is very important. They might love their child, but there's very little dedication to being present to how do you be present? You, you're in the same room and you're talking to the child and you're not saying, how you do, buddy? Doing okay, buddy? Got it? Okay, well, I gotta go to work, bye. No, you're sitting down and you're saying, talk to me. The teacher called the other day and said, you're not paying attention or you got in trouble the other day at the Boy Scouts retreat. What's going on? Talk to me. I'm so proud of one of the Columbine shooters her name was uh, Sue Klebold. Where are we at? Yeah, right up the road here at a hotel. She went around the country. She spoke right up here to a huge room full of people that came. She said uh, Dylan Klebold came home one day and he had blood all over his, his shirt, or what looked like blood. And she said, what is that? What is on your shirt? He says, I don't want to talk about it. He went to his room and closed his door. And see, Sue Klebold said, you're supposed to respect your child's privacy. You know, you don't want to pry too much. She said, I wish I had knocked on that door and talked to him. What happened? Some bullies had thrown some red dye, thrown on his shirt, shamed him, hurt his feelings, I'm sure. And that was just an incident that led to Columbine. Dead kids. Great. She was smart enough and bold enough to go around the country and say, this is what happened to my son. This is what I should have done. D2, disengaged. A lot of everything in the D quadrant starts with the letter D. I don't know how that happened. Uh, uh, and so relationship disruption is something that happens to lots of kids. They have the parent there, and then they're gone. Why? Well, some kind of uh, job takes them away for a long time. Got to make money. Deployment takes them away for a long time incarcerations, and a lot of times they, the, the parents use the child as a pawn. Of course, the divorce happens, and then it's like um, uh, they, they create the distance because they don't want to, to make the other parent happy, or they want to teach the other parent a lesson. And so well, I'm not going to let, I'm gonna let the child come. I'm not going to let the child talk to you on the phone. Terrible. Number three, of course, they can't help this, but we have to name it as something that affects children, disease, depression, disability, and death. That's loss. Trouncil, L, is loss. I think a lot of psychopaths, a lot, almost every person you see taking a gun and shooting somebody experienced a deep loss as a child. The kid in Michigan lost his best friend, lost his dog, lost his horses that they sold. The parents were behind on their mortgage. This kid was hurting. Where was mom and dad? Evidently not concerned enough. Let me see if I've got, did you love it? Wasn't that a great movie? James Bond, a little bit of psychology right there in pop culture. Uh, no time to die. He plays, Safin is one evil dude, wants to take over the world. James Bond asks him, why are you so hateful or vengeful? My whole family was killed. James Bond accuses him of being damaged. He says, we're all damaged. Well, that's not too far from the truth. That was a great line. 
So evil in the world so often is due to the damage left over. Now, read that chapter on Hitler. You'll see exactly what happened. What happened to Stalin? She writes about Stalin. That's Alice Miller. Number four of D4 is cold, distant, cold, and disinterested parenting. They're there. They're feeding them. They're making, getting them to school. They're doing everything very well, but there's no emotion there. There's coldness, just like in the movie, just like in the movie Tangled. I gave it four stars. I used to write the movie review for the White Rock Lake Weekly every week, every week for five years. I gave it four stars. Tops. Very good. Uh, and so that's emotional neglect. You can feed them, you can clothe them, you can put a roof over them, but you're neglecting them if you don't sit down and talk to them and saying, how do you feel? Oh, you're disappointed because you didn't make the cheerleading squad? I'm sorry, that is a disappointment. That, is, that makes me sad to think about it. I'm so sorry. So we got, I'm in a member of a TCA. I'm on uh, the board of D Dallas Metro Counseling Association as we have two right here, Leslie and Juan. Very good, thank you for coming. <clears throat> and uh, I'm the senator. So if you're a counselor, please get involved in your professional organization. Uh, we got sent by the TCA two articles in something called multi briefs. And both of them were about Preteens suicidal ideation. What are preteens doing thinking about suicide? They should be having a ball, maybe being with their friends, seeing movies, uh, sports activities. Something went wrong. The first article did almost nothing called tr translation psychiatry. A uh, lot of numbers and statistics and demographics. The second article that we were sent, well, there it goes. The second article that we were sent was in counseling um, today. Brilliant. It went into item after item after item after item of what parents should do to make sure that their kids either heal from suicidal ideation or never even get into thinking those thoughts. Okay? So that's the four quadrants of... Uh, Poor parenting. And, and uh, we have plenty of time. I wanted to say, if anybody's interested in continuing this conversation, meet me at my office tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And if that's not good for you, meet me at my office at 7 o'clock Saturday night. I want this conversation to keep going. Instead of however many people here, 15, I wish there were 15,000 people here. We have to get the word out. Don't do these things, mom. Don't do these things, dad, grandmother, uncle, older brother. This is not good for children, please. So I'm at 7424 Greenville Avenue. That's where my office is. And I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock tomorrow night if you all want to uh, show up and continue the conversation. If you have questions or things you want to say, please show up. And I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock Saturday, too. I've been dreaming of having a presentation like this in my office building on, like on a Saturday at, you know, for, for the past two years. So maybe we can get this thing going. Because there's kind of two statistics that are on my mind. How well is this information getting out to the parents of Texas? Um, the grade is a D minus. What percentage of people have really read a book and gone online? I wish I could show the... Uh, the slide, I'm on the Board of Advisors for ARC. That's the Adults Relating to Kids. It's a nonprofit out of Houston. Uh, Glenn Wilkerson, God bless him, he created this organization and he has parenting classes and videos online. Um, so if you want to learn about healthy parenting, uh, check out ARC. Um, I just learned about an organization here in town. I was going to try to remember the name of it, that uh, they're having Elizabeth Smart come to Dallas, you know, in April? What's the name of the organization? You know? No? Um, something like, something, anyway, it's, it's totally devoted to preventing child abuse. Good for them. You know, there's lots of organizations around <clears throat> um, that are involved in, in, in this. And so we need to 
to, 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 to keep going and keep expanding it. And of course, we need to have a class in every high school. And I wish I could show the thing. I didn't even bother to bring the, uh, I didn't think I'd have to use it, the power cord. But um, uh, I've been pushing for 20 years to get a class in every high school, uh, which cover four things. Number one, uh, personality development. Where does your, and how does your personality develop into ego strength and happiness? Number two, healthy relationships. Every one of you guys are gonna fall in love uh, and start dating somebody. How do you have a healthy relationship? Number three, healthy parenting. And number four, healthy lifestyles, okay? And that's all about bullying and using drugs and alcohol. Don't do it, right? And so I would like to, to push that. Well, guess what? The Texas legislature passed a uh, mandate that in all classes, all high schools, there should be a class in domestic violence, dating violence, child abuse, and human trafficking. Now, I think I read it's supposed to be four to six hours. That's way too little. We need an entire semester. So I hope you'll contact your senator, your representative. Let's get this bill passed in the spring of 2023 mandating a class in every high school that this is taught. But we got to teach them arithmetic and English. Well, yeah. But do you realize how many high school kids are taking a class in business management? Do you realize how many are taking them in, in I can't remember. Well, I mean, even, even, the, even the class in psychology. Of course, I totally support that. But it's like a survey class in the whole field of psychology. I asked one kid, well, what do you remember from that class? What did you take with... Um, nothing. Oh, no. He said, I remember I learned about hypnosis. <laughs> yes. So we can open it up. If, they, if the folks at home want to, uh, if you can tell, they can call, uh, put a question into the chat. The question I have for you is, where do you find that balance between too much structure and too little structure? Um, too much structure is just my way of saying, yelling at the child, screaming at the child, hitting the child, putting the, I had a parent the other day said, uh, yeah, put, put, put him in timeout. I said, well, well, how long did you put him in timeout? Oh, we just told him he was in time. I oh, know, grounded. Little kids, grounded. And I said, okay, you can't ground a child without saying for this long. He didn't know, he hadn't read it like I did 30 years ago. You know, it's right there in the literature. And so that's, Structure done wrong, okay? Too little structure is you're grounded, you know, for three hours. 30 minutes later, mom, I'm gonna go out and play. Okay, fine, go ahead and go. I'm busy, I don't wanna. And so too little structure is I don't follow through with the structure that I give you. Only give as much structure as you can handle. <laughs> don't, don't put the kid in time out if it's gonna be hard on you, you know? Um, uh, because then they learn, well, they don't really mean I have to sit in the, in the, in the chair for five minutes. I can kind of start squirming after one minute. I can run off and they'll let me. So that's too little structure. Am I getting, am I hitting close? Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to offer something or, you know, try and figure out where that balance is uh, from one extreme to the other. Well, I had one guy in a, in a, in a, in a group one time said, so the right thing to do is Somewhere in the middle, and I said, yeah, that's it. It's somewhere in the middle. Avoid this extreme, avoid this extreme, and you're doing good, because you're somewhere in the middle. So I would love to make this presentation at your organization. Be sure to ask me, yes. I'm having a struggle in my career in that I follow John Bradshaw Thankfully, Pia Melody, the uh, people who were my mentors. Mm -hmm. And as I've gone through the years, um, the children who have organic issues and the parents are still responsible for their parenting, even with that. But there was a movie I've seen a couple of times this year with Sidney Poitier, and it was made, I don't know if you know the name of it, it's made in 1960. And he was a psychologist who worked in a penitentiary. And he got a client who was a psychopath who had killed people. So he was mm. going to help him. And he, his approach was to, what was your childhood like? 
feel the pain, blah, blah, blah. And he went through it. Wow. And then the guy was coming after Sidney Clothier. So since Sidney Clothier had to decide what to do, and he went to the board and said, this man needs to stay here. He's unsafe. He will kill somebody else. And then the board decided to release the fella. So he got out, and he did kill someone else. So that movie I related to, because we want to help, and I've seen on special shows where there are psychiatrists that love working for the sociopath. Or they, that's their passion and their will. You know, they go into the penitentiaries and want to help. But I think... Where's the struggle? Well, the struggle is that um, it's so generational. It goes way back. Yes. You know, it just can go way back, plus if somebody's organic, that's something that's near to me. Um, and for the, so the crowd will know, organic means there's brain damage. Yes. Uh -huh. And so, and so there's, uh, that makes it really hard, but there was a, there was a girl <clears throat> on Dr. Phil one time, she was a sweet little girl, and then all of a sudden she was so mean, she would hit her little brother, she wouldn't obey, she would back talk, she would scream, and so Dr. Phil had, the little girl do a brain scan. And sure enough, she'd fallen off her tricycle when she was whatever, four, and it had damaged the brain. So the doctor that, uh, that did it said, we have adjusted the medication now with this brain damage in mind. We're taking this into account. So, so, so if there is a chance that there's brain damage, then they need to go to the right doctor who knows how to treat that. Okay, can I say, at the end of the movie, with Sidney Poitier, he's saying, why can two families, two people go through similar abuse, and one turns out this way, and one turns out doesn't kill people? That was his struggle at the end of the movie. It was, and I have that same struggle. Do you have that struggle? Yeah. I don't have that struggle. Why does one person... Let me answer your question. I was at APA, I think it was Denver, and I saw the, uh, the presentation. They had interviewed young ladies that were sexually abused, and um, you know they had the graduate students that were involved in that and everything, and he says, well, but the results of it is that there wasn't a significant connection between the abuse as a child and then dysfunction or depression as an adult, like we thought there would be. And he kind of went, don't know. And so I waited for some preeminent psychologist to speak up, and no one did. So I raised my hand. And I said, well, it's known and very possible that if a child who is abused and mistreated has one or two significant people in their lives that believe in them and make themselves feel, make them feel like a worthwhile human being, they will not suffer the, the deficits that the other people with the same abuse did suffer. So that's the reason why some turn out okay. You go back into that person's childhood, there was a grandmother, there was a school teacher, there was an older sister that cared about that child and listened to that child and had adult, 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 adult conversations about their feelings, not parent-child con conversations. That's your answer. Yeah. You know, one of the things I'd say is that's, as a resource, that's something we can be for all people, too. We can be that person that is the oasis for a small child. We can be the person who listens to them. That's right. There was another question off chat, um, and it was, how do you work with parents smothering their children? I cringe when I hear a parent saying their child is their best friend. Mm. Mm. Well, that's wh wh which one of the 16 sub areas? Pop quiz. Too much love. Uh, too much love. Yeah, it's it's B2. I, I'm just I'm just caring about you and I want to and it's not, I, I'm surprised I didn't have helicopter parenting uh, on there because that's what everybody knows that phrase is I'm really watching out for you. I want to take care of you. And that's half love and concern, but it can, if it gets to be too much, 
the parent is really taking care of themselves. They're worried, they're scared, they're anxious. No, 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 you can't go to that party. No, no, who knows who will be there? No, no, you, you gotta stay home. And so, you know, that's smother mothering. That's a term that goes way back to the 1950s. And I think the writer that used that terms said that these kids grow up to be, well, you know, psychopathological, maybe even schizophrenic, but that's, that's an overreach. They've, they've put, you know, they've, they've said that uh, that's, that's too much, too far. But there is, the, there, is the, there is the example of somebody who is overly concerned and protective. Yes? Next question. I've encountered many parents of troubled teens that say, I don't know what else to do. What resources do you recommend when the teen is out of control and the parent is frustrated and or disconnected? Family therapy. If that mother in Parkland, Florida had not called the police 39 times, but called the family therapist 39 times, that would have never have happened, I'd like to think. Because that was more trauma to this poor kid who was kind of developing to delayed, if you'll remember, to have the police show up. Well, and- I may be reading into it, but this, I think this is from a therapist who's saying, oh. we have some resources oh. for the therapist. Oh, well, uh, I, I, I go into healthy communication. And so if anybody's interested, I've got the 10 pillars of good communication that I share with all my couples and all my clients. Um, because if a kid is, is out of control, if, uh, if the parents will learn how to communicate in, in a way that helps the child feel heard and cared about, because I guarantee nine out of 10, maybe 49 out of 50, parents who are dealing with a kid who's acting out for whatever reason, has in the past, maybe they've gotten better now, have yelled at the kid, sit down and shut up. I'm sick and tired of it. You're hitting your little brother. How many times do I have to tell you? And so they commit this sin right here, this, ang this harsh, controlling, angry, authoritarian, um, A1, it's a mistake. And so they've got to really undo that by learning the 10 pillars of good communication and interacting in a way that makes the child finally feel heard and understood. And of course, there's tons of videos and books they could read. <laughs> but that's my short answer. So I have copies of both of those for anybody who wants them. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, my, which one should I do first? My significant other. Thank you, Jill, for being there for me this whole time, uh, loving me and supporting you, me. Uh, and I want to thank mom, of course. I thought about actually calling her up. I could do it right now, you know. Hey, mom, I'm doing the thing. It went pretty well. Yeah, I love you too. Okay, talk to you later. Bye-bye. That's healthy parenting. You're there for your son and daughter for the rest of your life. And so what a great example that is of great parenting. Any more questions before we close? We have 15 more minutes, but <laughs> that's up to you. Sorry, my, my power ran out. Any more questions? I want to keep doing this. Be at my office tomorrow at 7 if you're interested, or Saturday night at 7. I want to keep doing this presentation. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. So Dean and I want to let you know that there is uh, another presentation, March 15th, presented by Dr. Brian Dixon. Thank is you. there a pill for this? Insights from a Psychiatrist with Dr. Dixon. And then the Monday after that is April 19th. We have Lainey Knowlton and Brian Martin. And the topic there is the use of polygraphs and disclosures in therapy. And I think both of those are going to be very interesting. And they're both very dynamic and passionate speakers like Cedric, and I appreciate your passion. Thank you, Dina. I think it is a huge message that's important. And um, I just heard, I think it was a couple months ago, that the um, um, political body, I forget the name of it, in France was having a huge conversation about whether or not to make child um, sex with a child illegal, that that is still, in fact, something that is debatable in France. So that just took me.
me, took my breath away thinking that we had progressed beyond that, that in some parts of the world we haven't. So it is a message that needs to get out, and I appreciate that you are um, working so hard to do that. With that, we'll invite you all to come back next time. And again, we thank you for your attendance. Drive safe, and don't forget your CDUs. Let us know if you need them uh, at all. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. Have a good night. Glad you came.